Okay, thanks. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, we have another fun session of lightning talks, and every speaker has four minutes. So, I'm going to start right ahead. The first speaker is Shima Babadiasha. And yeah, please go ahead. Thanks, Christoph. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about one shot quantum state redistribution and quantum Markov chains. This is a drawn work with Anurag Anshu, Rahul Jain, Ashwin Nayak, and Dave Tushin. In the task of quantum state redistribution, there is a pure state rho R A B C where registers A and C are with Alice, register B is with Bob, and register R is with Alice. And Alice and Bob wants to transfer C coherently to Bob using a noiseless quantum channel and some shared entangled states. This task is well understood in the asymptotic and IAD setting and has communication rate given by conditional mutual information. Also, in the one shot setting, there have been lots of efforts uh, to characterize the optimal cost. However, all known bonds are suboptimal. For example, in the case that register R is trivial, uh, the cost of all previously known bonds uh, can be as large as log of dimension, whereas the optimal cost is known to be zero since uh, the desired final state can be shared between Alice and Bob uh, initially as the pre-shared entanglement. In this work, we introduce a new one-shot protocol uh, with a tighter cost that is optimal uh, for the previous special case, as well as for all other quantum mark states. Uh, a motivation for our bound uh, is the property that conditional mutual information can be written as the difference between relative entropy of rho RBC and sigma RBC and relative entropy of rho BC and sigma BC uh, when minimizing over all quantum Markov extension sigma RBC. Um, our bound is in fact an analog, uh, where, uh, a one-shot analog of this uh, expression where the relative entropy is replaced by max relative entropy in the first term and by hypothesis testing relative entropy in the second term. As far as we know, this is the first result uh, that operationally connects quantum uh, safety distribution and quantum Markov chains, and it gives an operational interpretation for a possible one-shot analog of conditional mutual information. Also, uh, it's known that if uh, Sabro RBC is classical, then the minimum max relative entropy distance from Markov, ch uh, Markov chains uh, characterizes the optimal cost of classical redistribution. And our protocol also achieves this optimal cost in this special case. And finally, our bound is tighter than all previously known bonds. In particular, uh, the best previously known bound is a similar bound where the minimization is over the set of um, product states rather than the set of all uh, quantum mark of extensions. Let me also br uh, briefly explain the high level idea of our protocol by explaining a uh, folklore uh, zero cost protocol for mark of states. So if rho RBC is a quantum mark of state, then it's known that it's a purification rho RABC can be a transformed to a state of this form through a local unitary operation and uh, where condition on registers J and J prime, registers R, A, R, and B, R are decoupled from registers A, C, C, and B, C. So in order to redistribute registers C, Alice and Bob can uh, condition on J and J prime decouple uh, A, C, C, B, C from A, R, B, uh, A, R, R, A, R, and B, R. And then embezzling the same system such that now register C and B, C are with Bob and register A, C is with Alice. And our protocol is in fact an advanced version of this protocol uh, where we're using the coherent flattening by embezzlement technique due to Anshu and J and also convex split and position-based decoding techniques uh, in order to make this protocol for work for an arbitrary state. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, we are a bit short on time with the talk, so maybe we can have eventual questions on, on Slack and move on sure. to the to the next speaker. I think the next speaker is Hao Jen Li. Hi. Hi. Uh, can I share my screen? Yeah, go ahead, share your slides. Um, can you see it? Yes. Okay, Perfect. shall I get started? Yeah, I think you can. Oh, okay. now, now okay. I already see. Okay. 
Yeah, you can go yeah. right ahead, I think. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Very happy to be here. Today, I'm going to talk about how geometric analysis benefit from quantum information theory. Let's get started with monotometric. Say we have a function f from r plus to r plus and two positive matrices rho and sigma. Then we can define a relative modular operator j. Here, l sub rho, this is left multiplication operator, left multiplication by rho, r sub sigma, this is right multiplication by sigma. Uh, since we are working with matrices, we can consider spectral decompositions. Um, they are discrete spectral decomposition. Then this J operator is basically um, a sure multiplier. And um, uh, by using this relative modular operator, we can define, we have a metric gamma. This gamma, it is the inner product of X and the J inverse acting on Y. So gamma is called a monotone metric if it is monotone decreasing under any quantum channel. So PASS has fully characterized the such metric. If F is operator monotone, then this uh, gamma, it is a monotone metric. We can further, we can further uh, generalize this uh, metric by considering a two variable function, capital F, and again, two positive matrices, rho and sigma. Instead of using relative modular operator, we are going to use a double operator integral. So the important part is here, instead of using uh, like a, fun uh, a function, one variable function, here we are using arbitrary two variable functions. And that's how and where we generalize this definition. And by using this double operator integral, we can have a new metric gamma. And uh, now we define a set C plus. C plus, it is a set of two variable functions such that the associated metric is monotone decreasing under any unital quantum channels. So if F is an operator monotone function, then this capital F induced from a small f is in C plus. And we have functions which are also in C plus, but they are not induced from operator monotone functions. For example, this capital F sub P for any P in zero and one. And finally, let me talk about applications of this generalized definition. So there is a family of inequalities called Beckner inequalities in geometric analysis. This is a family of inequality with a parameter P from one to two. If P is approaching two, it will become Penn-Curry inequality. Also people call it spatial gap. If P is approaching one, it will become log sublet inequality, which is related to the decoherence time of open quantum systems. And uh, this Beckner inequality, it is an uh, interpolation between spatial gap and and also log sublet inequalities. In classical analysis, uh, people have shown that Bakery and Emery criterion remain true for Beckner inequalities. By, by using the fact capital F is in C plus for P between zero and one, we can actually prove Bakery Emery condition remain true for matrix valued Beckner inequalities. And we are interested in exploring more functions in C+. Therefore, we can obtain more inequalities. Um, that's all for today. And thank you for your attention. OK, thank you very much. There's actually a half a minute or so if anyone has a quick question. But uh, I don't see any question right now. And thanks again. And maybe the next speaker can already set up. Okay. Oh, Deb. Should I start? Um, we can maybe wait like 20 seconds. So we're perfectly on schedule, but. Uh,
Yeah, but I think we can go ahead now. Okay, the next oh. is Sevilio. Please go ahead. So uh, this is joint work with Anna Ansu and Dave Toshet. Um, so we like to frame this as uh, an instance of quantum data compression. Uh, we draw a classical label X with probability PX, correspondingly a quantum state with um, a, on D dimension is prepared on a quantum system. Uh, we think that the referee would do this n times ID uh, resulting in this big joint state. Then the referee will give the quantum system to the sender Alice who may already share some resources with the receiver Bob and she will perform an encoding on the quantum system that she's supposed to transmit to Bob along with the shared resources. Um, she would then send an R qubit noiselessly uh, through a noiseless channel to Bob and Bob would decode. Of course, the goal is to make sure that the initial state that the referee prepared will now be distributed between the referee and Bob um, correctly with the minimum rate of communication. Um, in our problem, we will focus on uh, quantum states that are commuting in some specific basis. So we're actually thinking about uh, compressing classical distributions. We'll correspondingly take uh, the communication to be noiseless bits. So um, besides taking the states to be mixed commuting states, we consider the scenario when uh, Alice is not also the referee. Uh, a situation that we call blind um, versus the case when she actually know the labels for the states. Um, so we take the case when she doesn't know what are the distribution to be uh, compressed. And then we'll consider two uh, separate problems. Uh, the first is to consider lower bound on the rate when uh, entanglement is free. So this is the harder case when entanglement is free to uh, derive lower bounds. Uh, we will also show some achieving protocols without free entanglement. Uh, what distinguishes our work from the early work is that we consider per copy finite error. Um, in particular, the earlier work by Koashi and Imoto um, that characterized the rate uh, would not apply here because the rate is not vanishing. Uh, we allow the error to depend on the dimension of these states, which is D, and we, we take D to be quite large. So to summarize what we find, um, if you take an, any ensemble of two distribution on these symbols, without entanglement, you can still uh, compress at the rate of roughly 2a times log d when the error is on the order 1 over d to the a. If you take a to be uh, smaller than a half, then your uh, compression rate is substantially smaller than log d. Meanwhile, um, we can take two particular such distribution, the uniform one and the staircase distribution. Uh, in this particular example, if you take the local error to be of the order one over d to the fourth, the rate can be proved to be at least log d minus seven. Uh, so uh, between these two scenarios, just a, a slight switch in the exponent uh, of a uh, makes quite a big difference in the number of bits we need to send per copy. Um, in particular, the uh, rate above the whole level information is close to maximal allowed by the dimension. Um, I won't have time to show um, the analytic result uh, behind this bound. I'll just list it here. It has something to do with the fact that you cannot clone classical distribution. I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there's maybe half a minute for questions. If there's something quick, but... Uh... I don't see anything in the chat right now. But maybe there will be more questions certainly on, on Slack afterwards. So uh, thanks again. And maybe the next speaker is Nicholas, if you Hello. can. Hey. Let me try the uh, screen share. Yes, perfect. All right, can you see my talk now? Yes, I can see it. All right, and should I get started? Um, yeah, I think you can actually start right away. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to talk about a type of entropy inequality that goes by the name of quasi-factorization. This is an extension of a strong subadditivity-like inequality, first from subsystems to subalgebras, and then to subalgebras that may not have commuting restrictions, 
in which case the usual strong subadditivity will not hold. So this is a, a generalizing extension, but also a weaker inequality. So first, the type of algebras that we're looking at here are von Neumann algebras. And this will be in finite dimension where von Neumann algebras have a nice form in that they are block diagonal subalgebras of the bounded operators on a Hilbert space. So these really look like block diagonal matrices. Sometimes there can be repetition of blocks and these live within the matrices on Hilbert space. Now for a von Neumann subalgebra, there will be a unique conditional expectation, which is a map restricting to that subalgebra. So for example, if we take a bipartite system AB, then we can look at the algebra of operators on A, and this will have a conditional expectation given by a tracing out of the B system and replacement by a multiple of the identity. Pinching maps are also examples of conditional expectations. These restrict to commutative subalgebras. We also see a class of examples from taking subgroups of a unitary group and averaging over them. This average will give a conditional expectation to the invariant subalgebra of that group. Now, a particularly nice form of relative entropy is the relative entropy of a density with respect to its subalgebraic restriction. This is equal to a von Neumann algebra difference. And this will be obey a fundamental inequality. For two subalgebras with commuting restrictions, uh, commuting conditional expectations, there's a sort of subadditivity on the subalgebra relative entropies as shown here. Now, if you write this out in terms of von Neumann algebra differences, you see that it looks a lot like strong subadditivity. And that's because it really is strong subadditivity. These are equivalent. But what's notable here is that now you see that there is this commuting square condition, which is that the conditional expectations of the individual subalgebras must commute with each other. Otherwise, this inequality will fail. But we could still ask if there is a weaker inequality. And in this case, weakened by putting some constant on the right-hand side when this commuting square condition does not hold. So for example, even with a single qubit, we could look at a plane of the block sphere and take two axes through the center that are neither parallel nor perpendicular. These will define a pair of bases with non-commuting pinching maps. And so this is the type of situation where we might seek this inequality. Now this has been studied before. There are specific conditions under which such an inequality is known and it's used in comparing decay rates for quantum Markov semigroups. So the main result of this work is a theorem showing that there is such a quasi factorization inequality for sets of subalgebras when the intersection of those subalgebras is the complex scalar multiples of the identity. In particular, if we take an interleaved iterated product of the individual conditional expectations, we will find that this is equivalent to a convex combination of a completely mixing channel and another unital channel. The parameters of this convex combination are what determine the lower bound we get on the quasi-factorization constant. So thanks for listening. Um, there should be an extended version of this talk up soon. And I also encourage you to look at the archive link. And thanks to the conference organizers for letting me be here. OK, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, we are almost in time for the, for the next talk. So maybe we can have questions on Slack and the next speaker can set up already. And I think that's Jan Bao Sagen. Oh, yeah. I see you already here. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear. Oh, nice. And I see your PowerPoint. Okay.
Should okay. I start now? Um, yeah, I think we can go ahead. Right? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks for introducing. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm going to present our recent work, uh, a facing the randomness certification by quantum probability estimation. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Manny and Hong Hao. First, uh, let me briefly introduce the problem we want to solve. Uh, we want to generate random bits. Uh, for this, uh, we need a device called an entropy generator. Uh, we can use the device multiple times. Uh, at each time, we provide some random input and get some output. Um, finally, we get a sequence of inputs and a sequence of outputs. When we run the device, it may be correlated with some adversary, such as quantum adversary. So after the experiment, uh, we describe the joint state of the experimental results and the quantum adversary by a classical quantum state. Suppose we know uh, this classical quantum state, we can figure out the guessing probability and the associated measure of randomness and uh, called the main entropy. And in practice, we can get another flexible measure of randomness uh, based on main entropy. It's called a smooth conditional main entropy. And the smooth conditional main entropy quantifies the amount of randomness extractable. Uh, however, in this case, the extracted random bits will not be exactly uniform, but close to uniform bit. So our goal is just, just to try to uh, provide a lower bound on smooth conditional main entropy uh, without knowing which state uh, describes the experimental results in the end. We develop a measure to achieve this goal for arbitrary randomness generation schemes. And next, uh, let me briefly introduce the main idea of our method. So we first lower bound the smooth conditional main entropy by sandwiched running entropy and by literature results. So we only need to lower bound the summits the running entropy. And for this, we construct a function called a quantum estimation factor, QEF. And with this function, we can directly estimate summits the running entropy. This is a major advance of our measure compared with the previous measures. Previously, people use additional inequalities and to lower bound the summits the running entropy. So we expect our measure to perform better than previous methods. Uh, so finally, let me briefly demonstrate the power of our method. Um, device independent randomness generation uh, has been demonstrated in the last few years. Uh, for the first loop of free demonstration against the quantum adversary, here, you can see there is a time delay from the beginning of the experiments and to the point where we can certify randomness. Uh, we call this time delay the latency. Uh, for a soundness error 10 to minus five, the latency is about 13 hours. Uh, with our measure, we can achieve low latency and randomness generation in a device independently. And uh, we collaborated with the experimental group at the NIST Boulder, and we demonstrate our measure. Here you can see on average, it takes about five minutes to generate 512 random bits with the error bounded by two to minus 64. So with our measure, um, uh, practical implementation of device independent randomness generation is possible. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thanks a lot. There's a question by Mark. Maybe we can do that very quickly. Mark, do you want to ask it? Or? Oh, yeah. Um, I typed it in the chat. So you mentioned you had this method for estimating uh, what I thought would look like sandwich Renyi conditional entropy. I'm just wondering if that's available online. There was a question that came up during uh, Hamza's talk about uh, estimating sandwich Renyi entropy with a semi definite probability. Oh. So I was just curious. I, I heard uh, Hamda's talk. Yeah, I wonder mm -hmm. whether it's possible to use it uh, for our measure. So uh, I'm not sure. So um, 
Yeah, so it may be possible to use SDP, but currently we do not use SDP. We just use um, uh, some, I mean, it's not a facing the numerical algorithm, but uh, uh, it's effectively we can solve. We just parameterize the semester running entropy uh, using the smith coefficient of the joint state uh, shared between device and adversary in advance, and also the uh, measurement parameters. And we search over all the possible these parameters and figure out the optimal solution. But uh, it, yeah, it will be very great uh, if we can uh, formulate an SDP problem for this. Thank you for your comments. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And we should move on to the next speaker who already set up. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, the next speaker is Vishal Kataria, and yeah, please go ahead. Thanks everyone for sticking by in this final session of the day. Um, I'm going to talk about a work done with Eric and Nilanjana, who are at the University of Cambridge, um, and Mark, who both of us are at Louisiana State University. It's called Guesswork with Quantum Side Information. And of course, there's a longer talk on the website with much more details. So what is this thing that I'm calling Guesswork? It's a kind of entropic measure. It's a measure of uncertainty of a distribution. So consider a random variable that has this underlying distribution and k um, instances. Alice chooses a particular x. Bob is only allowed to ask questions of the form is x equal to that particular value. And these, he's only allowed to ask questions of this form until he gets the right answer. That is until Alice says yes. And this quantity is the guesswork. It's related to the entropy in this following way. You can think of it in a qualitative sense that the entropy comes from the average number of guesses when you're allowed to ask questions in a binary search tree. You're allowed to ask questions, does X belong to some subset? In guesswork, you're only allowed to ask equality questions and it's more like linear search. Therefore, the guesswork of a distribution is always going to be greater than the entropy of a distribution because linear search always takes more queries than binary search. What we do is we provide a nice framework for um, analyzing guesswork with quantum side information. So the framework we provide encompasses both no side information, classical side information, and quantum side information, where you have two parties, as I said, Alice and Bob. Bob has a quantum system that's somehow correlated to Alice's system. Bob's job is to then use his part of the system to perform some instrument and use the outcome of those measurements to make those guesses, to minimize the number of guesses. From classical work done on guesswork, we inherit these entropic bounds. Um, these H up arrow M, we call the B measured relative entropy. So I don't think this has been studied before too much. So we kind of named it where only the B system is being measured. So it's different from the measured Renyi entropy. Among our results, we show that the guesswork is concave and Lipschitz continuous. Another of our results is about equivalence of different types of guessing strategies. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, Bob has on his end, he has a particular quantum state and he wants to guess X. So he can do, his guessing strategy can go in three different ways. The first is to form a single POVM element, which has many, many outcomes. Each of these outcomes correspond to the sequence of the questions that he will ask. So once he performs the POVM, all he does is a, his strategy is, is pre-decided from the outcome of the POVM. Second strategy he can do is again a POVM, but with a, short, a smaller number of outcomes where his only goal is to get the best possible classical information or the best classical distribution. And then he performs the classical optimal strategy, which is quite simple. The third is kind of the most complicated where he's performing an adaptive sequence of quantum instruments, where he uses the result from each to make his next guess. And what we prove, which makes things very easy and mathematically tractable is that all of them are equivalent and give the same optimal guesswork. We use this for an, in an example where we're considering basically the BB84 task. Consider that Alice picks one of four symbols with uniform probability. Bob's uh, states are zero, one, plus, minus. And we have both an analytical and a numerical solution, which is something like 1.71, which is kind of counterintuitively better than 1.75, which he would have gotten in the zero, one basis. That's all I have to say for now. Thanks.
Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay. Yeah, as we move on to the next speaker, almost time. Um, I have uh, Sarah Shehad. Ah, perfect. Okay, I'll go ahead and mm -hmm. get started. Um, yeah, go ahead, please. Okay, um, first of all, thank you everyone for sticking around for the last half of the day. Um, I'm, I know we've all seen and heard a lot of new ideas, so it, one more talk and then we can rest. Um, so earlier today, um, we heard an excellent talk by Hanan Zhang about um, the data processing inequality for the alpha Z Reni relative entropies. And um, the techniques he uh, discussed were concave or convex trace functionals. So my talk is going to briefly um, share uh, some results about saturating that um, inequality with respect to certain parameters. Um, just a reminder uh, where this all started. Um, quantum relative entropy was defined in 1954 by Imagaki. And here is the definition um, with uh, the support condition to ensure that this quantity is finite. And uh, the data processing inequality um, for states rho and sigma was proven in 75 by Lindblad. And this, uh, you, um, some people think of this as a contractivity property, it says that um, when you pass your quantum states rho and sigma through a quantum channel, lambda, the inequality is, this inequality is preserved. Um, we lose information about rho and sigma, or in other words, we, um, the states become less distinguishable. And anytime we see any sort of inequality, it's always natural to ask when that inequality is in fact equal or when it is saturated. And that was answered by Petz in 1988. He proved that um, this inequality is saturated if and only if there exists a quantum channel such that that channel recovers rho and sigma. And this is the recovery condition. Um, that map rho depends, um, sorry, that map r depends on rho and lambda, and we can actually write out its explicit form. And since, since this um, result, any time a quantum relative entropy or a family of relative entropies um, was defined, it's very natural and of interest to ask whether or not the, in, the data processing inequality is satisfied and what sort of um, saturation results we have. Um, so Zhang also mentioned um, the alpha Rennie relative entropy and the alpha sandwiched Rennie relative entropy. And those families also have data processing inequality results as well as um, saturation results as well for certain parameters of alpha. So in particular, this family of entropy was introduced in 2015 by Conrad Ornard and Nilanjana Data, Data, excuse me. And um, this is indeed the most generalized family of relative entropies. And the, as Hanon Zeng um, gave the talk this morning, the data processing inequality was completely characterized in his recent paper. And as he also mentioned, there were several other um, people that worked on this uh, inequality uh, that had contributed several partial results building up to this final result. And in particular, I want to, uh, the result I want to share with you all today is um, whenever alpha is between one and two and Z is between alpha over two and alpha, there are some partial results for uh, the saturation uh, characterization. So if you let rho be a density operator, Sigma is a positive operator that in this case, we just need to restrict it a little more. Um, if I had more time to go through the proof steps, I would be able to explain what that set Q of H is. For now, just think of it as um, a, a more restrictive set of positive operators. And lambda is a quantum channel. If the data processing inequality is saturated, then we have this um, statement of equality for rho and sigma. This is not an if and only if statement. Um, however, there is um, an, another result um, in the reverse direction. And um, the only case that is known right now if, uh, to, to where this is an if and only if statement is when alpha is equal to Z. 
And that case is the san alpha sandwiched Rennie relative entropy case. And um, that result actually coincides with the paper by Felix Leditsky, Cambrice Ruiz, and Milan Data. And um, that's actually the, the work that inspired these results as well. Um, so it would be interesting to find um, more conditions so that um, it's always nice to have an if and only if statement for these types of results. Um, so th these are partial results. I'm very interested to see where else we can go with this. I know a couple of other people are interested as well. So that is all. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, well, there's a quick question for the last speaker. But um, I don't see any right now. Then, uh, yeah, thank you again. And